Hello, everyone. Greetings and welcome. My name is Adele Halliday. I serve at the General Counsel Office as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead, and I am the coordinator for this 40 Days program. So welcome to this live event for the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. We are glad that you are here. Uh, for this evening, uh, we will be exploring um, the United Nations and the future of people of African descent. Uh, we um, will be hearing from Michael McEachern, um, and he is a member and the rapporteur of the United Nations Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. He's an international activist for the human rights of people of African descent, as well as a researcher in Black studies, human rights studies, and postcolonialism. And as an activist, he has, among other things, co-founded several civil society organizations, and he's been deeply involved in the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent, as well as the establishment of the Permanent Forum for People of African Descent and European Union recognition of the fundamental rights of people of African descent. And Michael will be joining us by video shortly. Tonight, we're also thrilled that we also will have Barbara Reynolds with us. And Barbara Reynolds is the chairperson of the United Nations Working Group of People of, sorry, the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent. And Barbara will be with us live, um, sharing ideas and insights and is open to uh, responding to questions. And Barbara Reynolds is also the Vice President for Administration, Advancement and Planning at the University of the Southern Caribbean in Trinidad and Tobago. She served as Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Guyana from August, 2020, August 2014 to September 2019. And prior to this, she was the Head of Education for Save the Children UK after having spent the past two decades with UNICEF, working in areas of program management and representational roles. She began her professional career as a teacher and continues to be involved in education. She's also an active human rights professional and an experienced human rights and gender mainstreaming facilitator. So we are delighted that Barbara is with us as well. So welcome to Michael and Barbara. This event is in the broader context of the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. And this full week, uh, there are explorations of um, people of African descent and the topics of anti-Black racism. There are some written reflections available online from Deborah and Albertine. Um, Albertine's reflection explores when hope meets indifference and Deborah's explores emancipate yourself. There are also several featured books. Uh, so throughout the 40 days, we have a full book collection uh, that are available on the United Church Bookstore. And uh, there's uh, all of these books are available if you go to uh, ucrdstore.ca and then if you use a drop down menu for the 40 days of engagement on anti racism, and any of these books are available for ordering. This week in particular, though, we are, we are lifting up two books. Uh, one is called There's Something in the Water, and it explores environmental racism in Indigenous and Black communities in Canada. The other book that we are lifting up is called uh, "Are You Calling Me a Racist?" and it explores why we need to talk, be, why we need to stop talking about race, and start making anti-racist change. Uh, these books and more are available at the United Church Bookstore. There's a discount code of uh, for 40 days that's valid for 20% off orders of two or more books, um, and so all of these are available on the website for the 40 days. As well, available there is signing up for the newsletter if you are interested in um, and gathering that and keeping up to date that way. So welcome once again. We are glad you're here. And with that, we will move into um, hearing a little bit from Michael and his reflections around the United Nations and the future of people of African descent. Gre greetings, everyone, and uh, good evening uh, to you all. Um, my name is Michael McEachran, and I am one of the 10 members and the rapporteur of the United Nations Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. Uh, I'm terribly sorry that uh, I cannot be uh, with you uh, live uh, today. 
Um, I, uh, but I'm very glad that uh, Barbara Reynolds, the chair of the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent, uh, will be leading today's um, conversation uh, with you. Uh, I would like to begin uh, first by thanking the United Church of, of Canada for inviting me to, to speak at this session, and especially Adele, uh, who uh, I know since uh, before. Uh, thank you, Adele, for uh, inviting me to, to speak about the forum. So <clears throat> let me say a, a few words uh, about the, the permanent forum. Um, and I will leave it up to Barbara Reynolds to talk about the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African uh, Descent. So uh, just to give a very brief uh, and general uh, history of the UN Permanent Forum on People of African Descent, uh, it is uh, an extension or uh, an outcome, uh, one can say, uh, of the UN International Decade for people of African descent, uh, which stated in its program of activities for the decade that a permanent forum or a forum rather on people of African descent uh, should be established. Uh, and um, the permanent forum is an outcome uh, of, of that. Uh, the International Decade for People of African Descent, which runs from uh, 2014 or oh, no, so 2015 uh, until this year, uh, 2024, uh, is in turn uh, an outcome or result of the um, Third World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa, and its outcome, um, which was the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, uh, which is the uh, world's most comprehensive human rights instrument against racism and racial discrimination. Um, and uh, second in importance, or uh, legally anyway, uh, from the uh, only international convention against racial discrimination, which is the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, also known as the ISOD from 1960. Five. Um, so yes, the General Assembly uh, decided to establish uh, the Permanent Forum on People of African Descent in August 2021, which was on the 20th anniversary of the Durban uh, Conference and the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. The uh, Permanent Forum is to act as a consultative mechanism and a global platform for people of African descent and other relevant stakeholders across the world to discuss the social economic development and the human rights of people of African descent across the world and to offer advice and recommendations um, on people of African descent to the entire UN system and or and all its member states um and the, the permanent forum has so far uh, had uh, three annual sessions the first session was held in geneva in december 2022 the second session was held in new york in april 2023 and the third session was held earlier this year, again in Geneva in uh, April. Uh, and we have uh, so far um, produced uh, two reports to the Human Rights Council and General Assembly, um, which uh, um, is then an outcome of our sessions. The first report um, was presented to the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council last year and was an outcome of the, was based on the two first sessions and the second report um, was presented to the Human Rights Council uh, last week, I believe it was, and will be presented to the General Assembly, uh, I believe in uh, two weeks uh, time. 
Um, and so the uh, sessions, the three, four sessions have been huge events, uh, I, I would say, and, and a big success. Uh, the last event in Geneva uh, had uh, over a thousand participants from across the world. And this is the largest gathering at the UN of its kind. Uh, and um, the Permanent Forum has already proven to be, if you will, uh, a historic forum um, and the kind of forum that our, uh, you know, Pan-African and anti-colonial forebearers um, dreamt of. Uh, and uh, now it it is a, a reality. It, it is the largest global platform and forum for people of African descent, about people of African descent uh, in the world. Um, and although the UN defines people of African descent in terms of basically um, black people in the diaspora outside of Africa, uh, the Permanent Forum has made it very clear uh, that uh, it's uh, Pan-African in its vision and that the work of the Permanent Forum also um, should and will include and already does include uh, Africans on the continent uh, and the many issues that people of African descent in the diaspora and Africans on the continent uh, have in common. Uh, among the themes that have been discussed at the first, um, at the three first sessions, and that have been included in the two first reports to the uh, UN and its member states uh, are um, systemic and structural racism, reparatory justice for histories and legacies of enslavement and colonialism, transnational migration, education, uh, health, uh, yes, and uh, several uh, other uh, themes, such as also the second UN international decade for people of African descent which um, will most likely be declared uh, by the General Assembly later this year and run from next year, 2025, until um, 2034. And um, what has been central to the Permanent Forum um, is reparatory justice, as we like to call it, or reparations for people of African descent, for histories and legacies of enslavement, of genocide, of institutionalized, legally sanctioned racial segregation and discrimination, also referred to as apartheid, uh, and um, genocide. Um, and uh, this is a, 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 a major theme of, of the permanent forum. And I'm sure you have um, seen that this is a growing theme globally. And I know that there are such conversations also taking place in Canada. Uh, this is has become a, a major matter and theme in the US uh, with uh, several cities and uh, now the state of California, for instance, uh, uh, pursuing um, seriously uh, policies for reparatory justice or, 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 or reparations. And uh, this was a central theme of the Durban Conference in South Africa in 2001 and the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. Uh, the issue of reparatory justice is, is central. And I'm sure you're also familiar with that the Caribbean community CARICOM of 15 and its 15 member states uh, since 2013 are pursuing reparatory justice with its 10 point plan for reparatory justice 
and uh, for reparatory justice and development. Now, what is reparatory justice? Uh, we on the Permanent Forum, um, we um, are in the process of developing a comprehensive human rights-based approach to reparatory uh, justice. Uh, also within the framework of the UN Declaration on the Human Rights of People of African Descent, which is currently being drafted by the UN, and it belongs to the mandate of the Permanent Forum to contribute to the drafting of this declaration. Uh, and we believe that reparatory justice together with recognizing and addressing um, systemic and structural racism against people of African descent ought to be central to this declaration. And it is certainly central to the work of the permanent forum. Now, many of you and many people in general, when they hear the um, term reparations, they immediately think of it in terms of financial or monetary compensation. And this is a view that, for instance, the new government uh, of um, the United Kingdom uh, expressed uh, yesterday, I believe it was, uh, where they uh, said that at the uh, forthcoming uh, soon to happen uh, uh, meeting with the Commonwealth states uh, that reparations will not be on the agenda for the UK, not something that the UK is, is interested in discussing um, and uh, that they're not uh, interested in any sort of financial compensation for the past and they want to, as uh, they have said several times previously, they want to look forward to the future. Now, um, this is this sort of, of comment, if you will, is based on a misconception of how, for instance, CARICOM views reparatory justice and certainly how the Permanent Forum views reparatory justice from a human rights perspective. From a human rights perspective, uh, reparatory justice is primarily about rectifying the legacies and continuations of past injustices and crimes against humanity and in their place uh, establish uh, systems and structures of dignity, of equality, of the equal enjoyment of, of, of human rights. And it is not primarily a matter of financial compensation per se. This is not to say, of course, that if we were to rectify the lasting consequences or legacies of colonialism and its many crimes against humanity, in the Caribbean, for instance, and um, to address the lasting consequences of these past injustices in the Caribbean, as the CARICOM 10-point plan is meant to do, of course, this is going to cost. And of course, those states who have contributed to these crimes should pay or should rather um, be willing to um, address the legacies of these past uh, injustices. But again, the point here is not the financial compensation or the money per se, uh, no amount of money, no amount of financial compensation can compensate for the tremendous suffering and crimes against humanity that were perpetrated against people of African descent uh, and Africans, of course, in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Uh, rather, again, uh, it is a, a matter of rectifying or correcting 
the lasting consequences of these crimes. So that is um, the sort of perspective on reparatory justice that the permanent forum um, endorses, if you will. Uh, and we also think that this sort of perspective on reparatory justice should be uh, central to the forthcoming uh, declaration, uh, as, as I mentioned. Now, we also see reparatory justice as not only a matter that concerns, and this is very important, is not only a matter that concerns Africans and people of African descent. Um, it is a matter that is global and it is a matter of um, establishing social and international orders and social and international systems and structures that are equitable and that are firmly based on a respect for everyone's human dignity, rights, and flourishing. And in this sense, to reparatory justice is central to sustainable development. Uh, the two uh, core premises of sustainable development is to bring down the um, use of natural resources, including greenhouse emissions to sustainable levels. As we all know, um, not only in terms of greenhouse emissions, but in terms of other ecological uh, systems and areas such as our seas, uh, our use of land, our use of forests and so forth um, are being overused and exploited in ways that are not sustainable and that are harming our planet. So that needs to be addressed. And the so-called developed countries, which one must, uh, or the global north as, as they are also referred to, uh, w and, and when um, referring to, to the developed uh, world uh, or the global north, one should keep in mind that all so-called developed countries, except for Japan and perhaps Israel, are either European or former European colonial settler countries. And uh, with white majority populations. Whereas the great majority of the global South, the so-called developing countries are, um, are countries that um, most of them have been um, uh, colonized at some point by, by European countries um, and they have uh, majority uh, populations uh, with people of color. Um, and this sort of, and, and the, the, the relationship between the global south, uh, north and the south, between developed and developing countries is in many ways structurally unequal. Uh, this, uh, uh, for instance, in the use of natural resources, in how natural resources are used uh, today, we're in the global economy. Um, the, the use of natural resources in the global uh, south are mostly used in the end uh, to the uh, material and financial benefit to uh, countries and people and actors such as uh, businesses in the global north. The global north has contributed most to uh, greenhouse emissions and the current climate crisis, whereas people in the global south are suffering most from its consequences. And the list uh, goes uh, on. So there's this sort of inequitable relationship between global north and global south countries that are rooted in histories of colonialism. And uh, this needs to be corrected. And this is the second premise of sustainable development, 
is to create greater equity within and among countries uh, when it comes to social economic development. Uh, and in order for there to be universal and global development, these sort of structural inequities between global South and North countries need to be comprehensively, holistically addressed. And reparatory justice is a way and perhaps and probably most likely the most comprehensive way of recognizing and addressing this situation. So when we talk about reparatory justice for Africans and people of African descent, we do also, and it's important that we also have this sort of global view and that see that these are issues that concerns the health, well-being and future of the planet and of humanity. Now, I would encourage all of you to be involved in the work of the Permanent Forum, uh, also the work of the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent that Barbara will be uh, speaking about, uh, and to attend our annual sessions. And uh, as I always uh, or often like to say, the Permanent Forum will only be as powerful as we, the people, we, civil society, you listening to this call, the United Church of Canada and others make it. And we make it powerful by engaging in it and by using it to mobilize, to raise our voices and to demand change um, and to uh, hold states accountable for creating the sort of world that we would like to, to see. Um, I think uh, I, will, I will end here. Um, and uh, again, I'm sorry uh, that uh, I was not able to be with you live. Uh, I would have loved to speak with you and exchange with you in, in, in a Q&A, uh, but hopefully uh, we can make that happen another time. So again, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for the, uh, to the uh, thanks to the United uh, Church of Canada for inviting me. Again, uh, special uh, thanks uh, to uh, you, Adele, uh, and looking forward to seeing you in the future and working with you in the future. Um, thanks a lot. A special thank you to Michael for joining us by video and sharing that message. Um, you are welcome to raise uh, questions in the chat. Um, we are going to hear from Barbara Reynolds now live, and uh, she also has lots of insights to share and is open and available for questions. So thank you and over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Adele. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to be bold enough to say that if you have questions about what Michael just said, I'd be happy to attempt to answer them. And if not, I'll punt them to him when next I see him. I have his email address and I have his WhatsApp. Um, so thank you for asking me. Um, any questions that you thought that you might wish to um, ask Michael if he were here? Any burning issues? Or any comments, I'd be happy to convey that to him. And then I can say to him, I told you so, you should have said that. Okay, so Barbara, there's one question in the chat. There's a wondering if there's a plan to introduce environmental racism in the school system. So, okay. Example. Yes. So, so yeah. I'll definitely answer that in my few slides. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'll definitely answer that. So, that is Joan. Westcott, I hope I've pronounced the family name correctly. Definitely, yes. And I hope that I answer that a little bit more explicitly. Okay, so let me crack on. Please feel free to interrupt me. I'm comfortable. And um, 
I just wanted to share with you a few things and I'll go ahead and do just that. So here we are. This is you, the beginning of your um, 40 days of engagement, I think, um, on anti-racism. I, I said last week that I really don't care about who is racist or not. And I said that deliberately simply because as good Christians, you know, you can't control what anybody wants to believe. So we have choice. That's one thing the good Lord gave us. So people will choose to believe whatever they wish to believe, and people can choose to be racist or not racist. So I'm not here to fight uh, what people believe, but I am here to fight against discrimination. And so that's where my entry point is. I've put here a defense of the United Nations. So let's have some fun with it. My first point is it's the best we've got. And if it didn't exist, we would create it today. And I would have a good stab of creating it. In fact, in my less sane moments, I've often thought about how I would reorganize the UN to suit myself. Number two, it's a voluntary organization. It's not a super government, and we wouldn't want it to be a super government anyhow. So states gave up or continue to give up a little bit of their sovereignty and bind themselves through declarations and covenants and conventions to work together. Now, I know that that seems like a, an itsy bitsy thing, but it's a huge thing. It really, really, really is a big thing because going back to a couple of um, thousand years ago, we bought into this idea about sovereignty, whether it was the city state or the nation state, we like sovereignty. And so to give up a little bit of our sovereignty so that we get along is a huge thing. And whenever people bash the UN, which people have a right to do to bash the UN as much as you can, because we're all members of the UN, I usually say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you really want a super government, you know, when people ask, so why doesn't the UN do this or the UN should do that? I somebody who could just come into Canada and tell Canada, this is what you should do. This is how you should do it. I don't think that's what we want. And so we need to figure that out. Now, my third point about the UN is that we can't measure what has not happened. We just got, you know, that's the fundamental thing of immunization. Because when we do immunization, we do it on the intention of avoiding widespread disease. Now, who is to tell if you didn't immunize people whether there would have been widespread disease or not? We don't know. However, if history is prologue, we know there are several bullets that we've missed as a human race. And one of them is a third world war. And right now, I think many of us are a little bit anxious about how far are we going to skirt towards the edge of a third world war? How far are we going to go to damage our environment before we pull back? And that's where the UN comes in. So that's my three smiley faces. However, it's one vote, one country. Sounds good, right? So if you take Barbados that has like 350,000 people, it has the same vote as China one vote. But behind that one vote, as you probably would imagine, there is a lot of pressure. And so big countries, rich countries, pressure countries, less developed countries. So they may vote, they do, but it's still one vote, one country under pressure. So I've given that not quite a smiley face, the opposite. There are lots of deal making. Oh my goodness me, lots of deal making lots of wrangling, lots of talk, but not always walking. Two, so it's what we've got. So let's get to work, use it. 
And as a former staff member of a UN agency, I can tell you that it works. It, it, it's not perfect, but it works. And the more we use it, the better it gets. So you're here and you're embarking on your annual 40 days um, of active engagement in anti-racism advocacy and commitment. So I wanted to touch a little bit on the nexus between racism, discrimination, and development. And as you can see, as I have up here, racism is individual, it's institutional, it's structural, it's systemic. It's economic, it's social, it's cultural, and it's political, and it impacts on our development. It results in discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance. Now, what's this related intolerance? That's a big unknown X, but we're sure about xenophobia. And I come back to the root word of the word xenophobia, where I think that in the 21st century where we are now, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that phobia originated as a fear. And so while today it's about hatred and disdain, there's still elements of fear. And I am astounded. I am truly, truly, truly astounded that people would be af afraid of a Black woman like myself. And I look in the mirror and I say, but why are you afraid of me? What do you think I'm going to do? I mean, what is it about me that scares the living daylights out of some people? But it's true that there are people who fear Black people, African people, people of African descent. And we have to ask, why is there a fear? What is this to be fearful about? I have a couple of ideas that we can share at some other point in time. And so we come down to the focus of our work here, which is this work around anti-Black racism or Afrophobia. Ladies and gentlemen, my premise here is that xenophobia is not the same as xenophobia. Xenophobia is about the other, and we, we know that. Afrophobia is really about the fear of Black people, of people of African descent, people whose ancestors came from the continent of Africa, and what it means for us today. So... To what end is your 40 days of engagement in anti-racism work, Adele? I would hazard a guess that you're talking about the fulfillment and or the realization of the human rights of people of African descent. It's critical that we understand that this is a global issue, which is why I put the globe there. It's not about Canada. It's not about the U.S. It's not about Alaska. It's not about Vancouver or British Columbia. It is something that has enveloped the whole world, whether we like it or not. And one of the things that COVID brought to our attention is that we cannot separate ourselves from the other. And so we're locked into this earth. Now, I don't know if Elon Musk is gonna succeed in taking some of us off to Mars or wherever, but right now we're locked into this earth. It's a beautiful earth. It has enough food to feed all of us. It has enough space for all of us to build mansions. I don't mean you Christians, just the one up there, but right here on earth, it has enough space for all of us to have mansions. And there's enough ocean if you wanna go ski or sail or fish or whatever. But yet still on a daily basis, billions of people live in poverty Millions of children can't go to school. Many, many millions more don't have access to potable water within walking distance from their homes. They live in lousy houses that make them vulnerable to the elements. They are undernourished or um, just not able to, to feed themselves. Some people actually don't have sufficient clothes, especially with crimes have spaces, they don't have green spaces, they don't have leisure, they don't have peace in which to make their own choices. 
And so this idea about the fulfillment and realization of the human rights of people of African descent was situated and say, it's not just about people of African descent, because when we advocate and when we work for the realization of the human rights of people of African descent, the whole world benefits. Now, if you don't believe me, go back a little bit to history. Um, those of us who are feminists or gender specialists, you recall that when we advocated for the rights of women and girls, men benefited uh, because that's how it works. You know, it's, it's a question of the impact that we have on the whole society. When we advocated for the work for, for the rights of disabled people, everybody benefits. Now you think about some of the um, innovations that we have because people are disabled. Think about ramps. How often do we use ramps? Okay, ramps were really intended for people of, with disabilities so you can roll them. We use them all the time. I don't want to be lifting my suitcase through an airport so it has wheels and I go up and down ramps. Those ramps were actually intended for wheelchairs. But we use them, we benefit from them without even realizing just how when we advocate for the rights of one group, one small group, how we all benefit. And so it's critical. Okay, so civil rights, political rights, economic rights, social, cultural rights. Everybody knows about the two international covenants. They were entered into force, uh, sorry, they were declared in 1966 entered into force in 1976, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Com Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It's interesting, the history behind this, because um, the people in the Western countries pushed for civil and political. The people in the Eastern countries, that's how we developed, you know, we divided up our world back then, pushed for economic, social, and cultural rights. And it seems to me that if we look a little bit about our history, those who pushed for civil and political rights did us a because they were richer countries, they were powerful countries, and they kind of put in a hierarchy of rights, that civil and political rights were more important than economic, social, and cultural rights. That's not true. Our lived reality is that you could have all the civil and political rights that you wish, but if you don't have economic rights, if you're not economically viable, you don't have social development or cultural development, what's the point? What's the point of being able to vote if you can't afford to get the bus to go to the polling station? So you have the right to vote, but you can't vote because you've never been to school. So you wouldn't be able to get that ID card that says you can read, write, and um, do math, and therefore you can't vote. And so one of the principles of human rights is that rights are indivisible and interrelated. And I want to emphasize that point because you're not going to believe what I'm going to say. But there are countries that in the negotiation of the Declaration on people of, uh, for the promotion of the rights of people of African descent, Japan, for example, says that they object to including the right to development in a declaration for people of African descent. And it blows your mind away about the, 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 the ends to which people will go to achieve what they want to achieve. So the question, therefore, is, is this a question of individual or collective? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to put it to you that there is no distinction between individual and collective rights. Because we're here talking about the subject because people of African descent, Black people, whatever you want to call it, are looked at as a collective. And so individual rights, collective rights, doesn't really matter. But there are countries that object to the concept of collective rights, for people of African descent, um, countries like the US, UK, the EU, as we go through the negotiation for that declaration, they raise their flag every time it comes up and say things like, well, my delegation does not see how people of African descent could have collective rights. We understand it for indigenous people, but we don't people of African descent. So 
What are the working group's four contemporary priorities? Racial justice. And we know that this is about recognition, justice, and development. That's what the decade was about. And when we did our review, we all realized that not much was done. Not many color countries invested. They didn't even promulgate it. So our um, advocacy of the last three or four years has just been, there must be a second decade. But when there is a second decade, we want in the first instance that member states will promulgate it. Go back and tell every citizen there is a decade for people of African descent. Not go back and tell Black people that. Go back and tell every citizen because it's everybody's business. That's one. And then secondly, to invest in the decade, invest in people, invest in structures, invest in policies. And then third, very, very importantly, right of activists and advocates to speak out. They must be protected at home and they shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't be punished for speaking out. So racial justice, reparatory justice, righting historical wrongs, Enslavement, colonization, segregation, apartheid, whatever it is we want to call it, we know about it. Environmental justice. This answers the question that Ms. Westcott posed, that yes, environmental justice is a priority for the working group, as it is for many, many people around the world. And we see this as putting down a marker for future generations. I'm sorry about the S there, because... We can't wait for them to wake up 50 years from now and say, why didn't we do X or Y? So whether it's about clean air, potable water, cities that are sinking because they're on the periphery, whether it's about the blue economy or the green economy, environmental justice is a priority. And then of course, digital justice, dealing with the knowns and unknowns. So last week, I presented the Working Group's 2024 thematic report to the Human Rights Council. It was on digitalization, AI, and new and emerging technologies. I have to tell you, I felt very loved last week because it was the first time that, you know, I didn't have a barrage of people saying, I don't agree with you because interestingly, every um, delegation that took the floor recognized and accepted what we said because we have a sense, all of us as human beings, that we've left this just a tad too late and that the private sector has leapt ahead of states without any regulation, without any ethics, without any sanctions. And so we're just trying to catch up. And there are many knowns, but there are also many unknowns in digital justice. And we see this as kind of a template for our work for the next few years. So what does the working group do? Well, it was established as a Durban mechanism in 2002. So we are 22 years old. Um, two years ago, we did a 20 year report where we looked at all of the thematic reports that we presented. For example, last year we presented a thematic report on economic empowerment of people of African descent the year before on children of African descent. Um, and so we have this body of research, of studies, um, evidence-driven um, conclusions, findings, and recommendations that we've shared with the world. So we're five members from the five Put this down here just for fun. So, you know, the UN is an interesting place. So, of course, the UN has regions like the Africa region. Yeah, that's pretty um, straightforward. The Africa region is pretty straightforward. And then it has um, Latin America and the Caribbean. That's, that's, that's easy. Then it has Asia. That's also pretty easy. And then it has the Middle East and North Africa. That's also very, very easy. And then it has an interesting fifth region. It's called Western Europe. And guess who is in this region? Well, you've got the Western European countries, not Eastern Europe. You've got Japan. You've got Australia. You've got New Zealand. You've got the US, Canada, and the UK. Nice region, huh? Geographic. 
And then the working group has some instruments at its disposal. So here are the instruments that the working group has. Research and studies. I just mentioned our thematic reports. We have country fact-finding visits. Um, last week, I, I presented our report on our fact-finding visit to Norway. And we take this very, very, very seriously. And sometimes I am surprised that governments are surprised when we point out what's wrong at home and that racism is actually very much part of the warp and the weave of countries. And quote unquote, even a country like Norway, when you go there and you look at what's happening or you go to a country like Australia and we see the indefinite detention of South Sudanese migrants who were taken to Australia to have a chance at a new life. And we see that um, South Sudanese men of Africa um, are disproportionately in prison with indefinite term sunset clause. They have gone there based on uh, a character test. So no due process. It's important, these fact-finding visits. We only do two a year, but they do have some impact. We do technical support and academic visits where we train people, we engage in scholarly um, um, discussions and discourse as we, as we advocate. We do communications and these are advocacy like I'm doing this evening, allegation letters where we actually write to member states and say, based on the evidence, this is what we found and we ask them to account for what we have found we do urgent appeals. We intervene in court cases. We file amicus briefs, um, sometimes to stay um, decisions, sometimes to contribute towards decisions. And we do press briefings. And then a couple of final slides, key moments ahead of us, the close of the current decade. I think on November 6, 7, uh, I think seven or eight, there'll be a formal high-level meeting in New York to close the current decade. And then we hope for a second decade, and I've already said what uh, we want from there. There's the unfinished work of recognition, justice, and development from the first decade, but there's work ahead of us to do in terms of reparatory justice, in terms of environmental justice, in terms of digital justice. And ladies and gentlemen, by saying that it doesn't um, exclude gender justice, it doesn't exclude anything. It's just a question of finite time, finite resources, and where we choose to place our emphasis. And then, so I represent the working group on these negotiations, as I've mentioned to you, and it's coming along, but there's a big fight ahead. Because if a country like Japan tells us that they object to the inclusion of a right to development and a declaration of the rights of people of African descent, we do have some concerns about that. Or other delegations say they, they, they object to the inclusion of the right to a healthy and sustainable environment. So you understand the, the, the impact and the import of this declaration. And then our 35th session, as you can see, we've been at this 20 years with a body of work behind us. Our 35th session will take place in uh, New York at the UN headquarters, December two to six. And the focus is on principles, provisions, and pathways to reparatory justice for people of African descent. And we'll look at representation. So lots of people talking about reparations and reparatory justice. But who is representing who and why and how and where and when? So that, for example, when some countries say that they are advocating for reparatory justice and they're repressing Black people in their own countries, I have a problem with that. So representation is an important issue. And then the whole thing about recognition, acknowledgement, and apology. What's the value of this and what's the utility? not emotionally, but legally, okay? So the King of Netherlands has apologized, but in July, the Parliament of the Netherlands voted not to deal with reparatory justice. So the repair of ways of being, living, knowing, and living together. And I'm gonna say very, very publicly, and I've said it before, 
and people have some repair to do in the house at home, some housekeeping. There's still too much distance between Caribbean Blacks and American Blacks and Canadian Blacks and African Blacks and a whole deal of nonsense, in my humble opinion. Reimagining and reshaping language and education and spaces and places. Yes, reparations, restitution, and the return of artifacts and assets. Last year at our session on economic empowerment, we had the master of Jesus College at Cambridge University talking about their work in returning a Ben and Bronze. And ladies and gentlemen, I know for a fact that in the basement of all of these big museums in, in developed countries and in universities, lots of artifacts and assets that were stolen from, not just from Africa, but elsewhere. Then the reform of institutions, laws, policies, structures, systems, and practices. And of course, at the apex of all of this has to be not just for the symbolism, but an emblematic case of Haiti. Haiti that secured independence, that they fought for independence in 1804 from France, and then were forced to pay France for uh, the loss of their property. And then of course, being forced to bank with France and all of that. And so reparatory justice for Haiti is a global priority. And it's not just about the symbolism and the instrumentality, but it simply says to all of us, if we have to achieve proprietary justice, Haiti has to be a big part of that. And then finally, remembering Durban and the centrality of the DDPA. And so my final slide to you as the United Church of Canada, what would Jesus do? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barbara. Very much appreciated your overview of, of this part of the UN. Um, there is another question that has come up in the chat and everyone is welcome to add additional questions to the chat based on what you've heard from Barbara or what you've heard from Michael before. Uh, but the additional question that's in the chat right now is around reparations. And it names uh, that the idea of reparations to African people or people of African descent is an idea that is long overdue. Uh, the UK has indicated they are not interested in discussing financial reparations. So are there other, uh, are they willing to consider other types of reparations? And what about other countries such as the United States? And we can add Canada to that too. So, uh, is there so anything no country has come forward yet and said that they are willing to really engage around reparations because they know there's a cost. And there's a Judge Robinson who has worked out an economic cost, um, doing the figures in terms of um, uh, the loss of life, the loss of liberty, the loss of income, compensatory figures, you know, the typical legal thing. It's a colossal um, amount of money. Um, will they deal with it? Eventually they will. One of the beautiful things, ladies and gentlemen, uh, is the fact that I'm sitting here this evening tells me that all of these things are possible. If you think about some of the things that you have seen in your lifetime, I remember being glued to the television, watching Nelson Mandela walk out of prison. I sat like that uh, next to my two sisters, just like this. Wow. I've been to... Um, that island and seeing Nelson Mandela's um, the cell and ladies and gentlemen the sun on that limestone will blind you and imagine a gentleman goes through that for more than two decades and then is able to walk out with his dick and refrain from causing a civil war that a lot of what we have seen in our lifetime is possible to be replicated in different ways. So I do believe that these countries will have to deal with reparatory justice. They have to deal with it because they have benefited from it, okay? And the same time they were benefiting from it cumulatively 
in having a multiplier effect, people of African descent were being deprived cumulatively with a multiplier effect. And so at some point in the future, uh, countries will have to deal with it. I don't know when, um, but it will happen. Two points for me as a black person, black people have to be prepared to deal with it. I was in Accra last year, and as I'm coming back to the hotel, there's this young, lovely young man. You know, after a while, they get friendly. They ask you, how's your day and what have you and what have you? And, you know, I love to chat with young people. So I said to this kid, uh, he asked me, how was I there? I said, well, I'm a bit tired and what have you. So he asked me, you know, was I where? I said, no, I was at a conference on reparatory justice that the president of Ghana had convened with the AU, blah, blah, blah. And you know what he says to me? I want my check. <laughs> and I had to stop right there in the elevator with the laptop here and a bunch of papers here. I needed to stop and do a lesson right there and explain to this young man, it's not about a check and that a check was not gonna materialize into his hands. And I don't know if he would wanna check. So I spent about a good 20 minutes trying to work with this young man and I hope it sticks. The point I'm making here is that we have a lot of education to do not just of ourselves, but to those people from whom we claim justice. It's not about the check. It's not only about the check. And if we got the check, what would we do with it? And who says what the check should be? All of those things need to be discussed and they need to be discussed rationally and, and, and clearly. Apart from the governments, two of my favorite people, institutions from whom we must claim Preparatory justice would be the insurance companies like Lloyd that built its wealth on ensuring the property, the human property of various people, insuring them against the loss of their human property. I don't know why Lloyd's, but, uh, let me not go there. The insurance people, that's one. The banking people, the Dutch East India company that was the precursor for where we are. France, West African countries, they were forced they were forced to bank their money in French France. So all of this mess has to do with governments, but it also has to do with the private sector, which continues to exploit. And then it has to do with religious autocracies. So the church has always been complicit, has always been complicit. Whatever denomination, I don't care. I'm and I know the church has been complicit. And not only has the church been complicit, been complicit in colonization, segregation, colorism, racism, anything else. So these are the big three, the kind of private sector people, the banking, insurance company, the miners, the what have you, the religious autocracies, and then the governments. Now, some governments will argue, as the UK does, we're good people, okay? We can't be accountable for our ancestors. I agree. As long as you admit that you're a beneficiary of the cumulative wealth and privilege of your ancestors, and I'm a beneficiary for the lack of or for the, de the cumulative deprivation of my ancestors. If we can agree with that, we have a match made in heaven. And on this basis, we can go ahead. What I would love to see, however, is a degree of civility I would love to see a degree of rational thought. And I'd love for people of African descent to really, really figure out when it does happen, are you gonna be prepared for it? Because I mean, Hollywood is littered with rich black people who became um, declared bankruptcy after you know a couple of years because they just weren't prepared. So we have to be prepared. And as I said before, that work has to be done within the Black community. So if you know any Black people, what a sister said, just don't wait for it to happen. Go prepare. You know, they usually tell you, if you're praying for rain, take out your umbrella. So if we're looking for a part to be justice, let's, let's get ourselves organized. And I say this to Black people all the time. So I'm not just saying it because <laughs> I, say, I say it to Black people.
our act together. Um, so, so, so it is over about the school systems. School systems are not monochromatic, so they vary over time and space. I am disappointed at what I see in some parts of particularly the U.S. in terms of kind of putting a little bit of a poison pen into the minds of young children. I figure it will reverse itself at some point in time, but I'm concerned about the impact on young children who instinctively believe what their teachers and parents say um, while they're still in their formative years and how that will affect them. I do think that our textbooks are horrible because they just don't do justice to history in a civil manner, in a rational manner, in an honest manner. And the downside of that is if you look at kids who are say 18 to 25, 27 now, they've lost kind of their faith in us because we just have messed up royally. And so getting back to education systems that educate people for the future, that are relevant, that are focused on citizenship, on employability, on being able to be employed, whether it's self-employed or whatever, about philanthropy and volunteerism and community, um, we lost a little bit of that and we need to find it again. So the school systems, definitely. Um, whoever can, it's a job that has to be done. And yes, there is no harm in putting environmental racism in there. I just want to say one thing about this racism, racism thing before I forget, Adele. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not a black and white matter. I think instinctively, because colonizers and enslavers were white, that people of African descent speak to um, people of European descent, white people, about racism. But we must also accept that racism comes in many different shapes and sizes and hues and textures. And while my working group focuses on people of African descent, we do work very closely with a special rapporteur on racism. So there's racism across the globe. You got black racists too, so we just have to deal with them. Asians, um, you know, and, 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 and we see this coming out now because we've started to speak to ourselves in terms of color. So there are blacks and whites and browns and whatever. Simply a mask to say that we've kind of accepted this thing and we're trying now to deal with it and touch it. People of African descent currently are being exploited by non-white people who are just as hegemonic as the former enslavers and colonizers. If you look at mining, if you look at extraction. So I would stop there when it comes to environmental racism and say it's not a black white issue either literally or metaphorically. Thank you, Barbara. Um, there are two more questions that have emerged. So one- and Adele, we just don't okay. need questions. We, we, we're comfortable with comments and I don't, or why did you say that? That doesn't make sense. We're comfortable with all of that too. Yes. Okay. So people are welcome. People are welcome to make comments. And so far, though, what has emerged are questions. <laughs> so uh, here are the questions that are emerged, still on the theme of, of reparations and reparatory justice. Um, and so what what is posed here is in seeking reparatory justice, whether in the giving end or receiving end, is it not important? to understand it is not individual, but rather collective, is not individual desire to acquire more, such as more power, wealth, territory, resources, and so on, the root cause of what causes the need for repertory justice. I think um, the second question is difficult to answer. I truly don't know. Um, is that a moral issue or a social issue or economic issue? I don't know. Um, I know a lot of people who will 
prefer to sit under a coconut tree and drink pina coladas. Wealth, not everybody wants wealth. Um, territory, not everybody wants territory. In fact, I would hazard a guess that it's really a minority of people in every country, every race, um, that 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 seeks this kind of more power, more wealth, more territory. Um, I've lived around the world and everywhere I've gone, I think I found that people just want to be happy, have a family, feed them, go on holiday, whatever a holiday turns out to be, and see their children's children. That's very important, I think, in every society. This concept of seeing my children's children is very important. So I'm not sure about the second question. I'm not sure how much philosophy is in that or what have you. So I'll respectfully just leave it at that. The first question, absolutely. And that's why I raised the issue of this because when the EU says to, you know, the plenary in the um, negotiations about the declaration that they understand collective rights of indigenous people or indigenous peoples, but they don't see um, collective rights for people of African descent, I get very, very worried. Because if we're negotiating a declaration, people of African descent, that's by default a collective. We're Black people. People of African descent is already a collective. They were enslaved as a group. And so I think sometimes we hide behind these, these very um, intellectual things about whether anybody other than indigenous people could have collective rights. Of course they have. I mean, everybody has collective rights. My high school people think they have rights. I just went to my high school's 150th anniversary a couple months ago, and we were all crazy talking about school and 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 you know walking around my my hometown, saying we're bishops girls and you know all that kind of jazz and making a big noise and big fuss because we felt we were special. Now, probably we're not, but it's a collective thing. And so I think we we do operate in the collective and in the individual, all of us. The Church of Canada is a collective. That's why you're gathered here. And so anybody who says to me that they don't believe in collective anything, I think is just not being real. For people of African descent, it's important that we deal with the collective impact of racism, discrimination, enslavement, colonization, fracking, digital inequities, because we're suffering as a group. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll speak as a black woman. In many ways, it doesn't matter how educated I am, how well I speak or don't speak, whether I dress properly or don't dress properly, I will always be viewed as a black woman. And so as a black person, I wear that in my skin, it's in my genes, it's in my brain cells. Um, it's not a question of whether I want to be or not. It is who I am. It is my lived experience. The same way um, for a white person or any other person, it's a reality. And therefore, my job, my role is not to question whether we are collective or not. It's to say then, how do we, as people of African descent, as Black people, how do we relate with other people of other races or other colors? And um, and that's just one dimension. I was to meeting last week in gender intersectionality. So it's not just the color of my skin or the texture of my hair, but it's my gender, it's my socioeconomic status, it's my sexual orientation, it's my education, it's, I sat right next to the special rapporteur and 
racism. She's a Dalit. Okay. So in India, it's all one race, but try explaining caste to anyone outside of India. And, and I continue to try to figure out how did India arrive at a point where you have one caste that is untouchable or invisible? We're human beings. And so we arrive there. And so I think the collective is non-negotiable. It exists. And I don't mean as an, you know, a big philosophical, psychological construct. That's just how we mediate our reality. We do so as individuals as well as collectives. Everybody on the platform is Canadian except for me. So that's 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 who you are. That's what I am. I'm not Canadian. And so for you, I might be the other. Um, but if we look at it other ways, there's some um, men, I'm not a male. There's some women, um, and we can go down the line. So that's where we are. Right. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, there's a comment now, comment as well as a question. So the comment is an expression of thanks uh, for unpacking all that is involved in repertory justice and the links to race, um, environmental racism and broader questions of justice. So noting that thanks and also that that's a lot to digest. So that's one comment. Uh, in addition, there's also a, a question. And the question is, is it possible for the UN to create a curriculum that could be used anywhere in the world or by national or provincial ministries of education in a way that can be integrated with the local curriculum? Good question. UNESCO has done um, an excellent job on some of these. So if you go to the UNESCO website, they have done a lot of work on um, memory in terms of enslavement with a lot of resources. Um, the UNESCO is really, really good at, eh? um, really, really good with, 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 with the work that they prepare. Um, the question is always when you take that resource to your local school system, how can it be integrated? Is it going to be a yes from the board of education or a no, um, with all that we've packed into school? you know, grade school curricula these days. I mean, it's no longer reading, writing, and arithmetic. So they've got to do, I don't know, nutrition, civics. How do you integrate it? So it's there. How do you integrate it? A couple of other people, academics, or um, others interested are just getting together to do a global African studies curriculum. Now, this is in part a pushback from what we see happening in the US where um, ethnic studies have been perhaps given a bad name and are being annihilated, AKA unfunded. And therefore, if you're unfunded, you can't run a program. So they've just got together um, to do that. And, I'm reminded that I've been told not to say they, so it really should be we. I'm not an academic, so I will, um, you know, make my little inputs on the side from a curriculum perspective, um, from a human rights perspective. But they're doing that, and the idea is that this would be a resource that's available to the public just to revisit the whole question about Black studies, about African studies. And ladies and gentlemen, if you go back 20, 30 years, you remember we had Asian studies, we had um, first people studies, we had all kinds of studies. And the idea is that by default, it was the dominant culture, and therefore we needed to look at minority cultures and history. And so it's always a good thing. And I hope that that will materialize. And I hope that this, this vein of thing that's happening mostly in the US about, oh, I don't know, critical race theory and taking books off of curriculum and all kinds of interesting things. Um, I hope that that wanes and that there could be some possibilities that um, people can again talk about issues that are dear to their heart and write books 
And I'll be the first to say that I, I can't read every book. So some books might be offensive to me, but I don't think I don't think we need to read every book that's ever written. But certainly I think people who want to write books should be able to write books and then we should exercise our choice about what we read. And certainly if we have a minor who is under 18, we provide guidance to that person. So that's just my little two cents on that one. But certainly we want that to come back. I'm wondering, yeah, I think I dealt with that. Um, look, rich countries are going to go to every environmental summit and try to railroad it, okay? So if we look at environmental racism, we don't necessarily have to call it environmental racism, but we can certainly talk to our children about environmental issues. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not just in the school system. Most of us have scouts, pathfinders, master guides, um, Lions Clubs, you name it. We, we do get together. And so um, thank God for the internet. Um, the church can educate its congregants about the environment, even if we don't go to environmental racism. Um, I personally prefer the term environmental justice more than environmental racism. Um, but that's maybe splitting a hair too much. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to do so. And talk about the environment, talk about digital justice. My goodness gracious me, the crazy stuff that's happening with AI is scary. It truly is scary. And I'm hoping that governments step up and put in place a regulatory regime. They put in place standards. They put in place sanctions. So that's what I would say. Great, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, we are nearing the end of our time together, and I wondered if you might be willing to share some words of um, encouragement or or uh, challenge to the people who are gathered here. What are what might be some suggested actions that people might be able to take? Um, recognizing you have church leaders here from across the country, um, based on what we've heard, what are some suggested actions that people could do in their own communities? Thank you, Adele. Um, my last slide, what would Jesus do? I really do mean that. It's not just a sticker. Um, I, I come from a church where every quarter we have a lesson. And um, we study it together wherever you are in the world, okay? I'm a practicing Seventh-day Adventist. My siblings and I, my girl siblings and I, on Friday evening get together wherever we are in the world on Zoom and we study the lesson together. And then we gossip and we talk and we do all kinds of crazy things. Um, so for example, on Friday evening, I was in Geneva and I set my alarm for five minutes to one so I could get up at one o'clock and be on Zoom with my sisters from 1 until 3 a.m. because that time is precious for me. So what do we do there? We look at what the Bible says about a number of issues, and we try to extrapolate in a concrete way about what that means for us. My sense is that that's one of the pathways for Christians to really go back to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say about this? What would Jesus do? And he's left sufficient markers for us to be able to parse that. Um, the Bible has for me an answer to every single question or dilemma that I encounter, including how much ice cream should I eat at every any given time? And whether I should just completely come off chocolates as I'm trying to do. But, you know, I as I pass through, um, when you pass through the airports, they just bombard you, right? About, there was a question just now, should I be buying any more clothes this year when I can't wear all the clothes that I have? Those are the mundane things. The serious things 
would be when I look at another person regardless of or because of the person's race or gender or sexual orientation or disability or class or caste or socioeconomic status or level of education, what do I owe the other person? So I need to pay my debt to what I owe the other person first before I expect the person to give me what's my due. And I think that as a Christian, the debt that I owe the other person is first of all, recognition that that person is a fellow traveler, as a human being. And second, that I owe the person a duty of care at the minimum to do no harm. And if that's all I can do, that's fine. But if I can do more, that's pretty good. I owe the person um, kind of like a cheerfulness, kind of like, um, you know, not making it too um, burdensome, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I would leave it there because you know, we could argue, I mean, my 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 siblings and I and my brother-in-law, we argue about, you know, what a particular passage meant. But we do that mostly for fun. At the end of the day, we have one another's back. Um, and we we will, you know, we will back one another. And that's how do we step it out? When I meet someone in the airport, or when I look at you, whom do I see? And basically. I have this habit of telling myself that, um, you know, God really, really loved Hitler and he died for Hitler. And therefore, you know, if he could die for Hitler, then who am I to judge? So that's what I would leave for you because ultimately as a collective tonight on this platform, you have presented as the United Church of Canada. And I do acknowledge that. Each of us belongs in multiple collectives. So, you know, family, school, political party, whatever. Um, we're not going to perhaps get it 100% right, but I do hope that we can at least try to think about what Jesus would do were he here in the 21st century with all of the privilege that we have, all of the blessings that we have, and try to diminish the confusion that and chaos we've created as human beings. So thank you very much for sharing the last 90 minutes with me. Thank you for um, walking the journey. It is a journey. I hope you keep walking. I hope you keep focused on what you think is right under God. And I'm sure that we'll come out at the end of it for better people. And thank you, Adele, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to join you and a privilege to be here. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, this was excellent. We are so thankful for your insights and all that you've shared today. And thankful also for Michael earlier coming to us by video. Um, friends, we would invite all of you tonight to offer your feedback on uh, tonight's event. Um, there's a very short survey that I've just put in the chat here. Um, it will only take two minutes. Uh, if you're willing to um, pull that up and do that on SurveyMonkey uh, as you go, that would be wonderful. And thank you all for being here. Uh, you're welcome back anytime uh, for the continued live events that will continue on Tuesdays at seven o'clock in the evening. Um, and please feel free to sign up for the newsletter to stay up to date on all that will be happening in these 40 days and the very many ways to engage. So thank you once again for being here. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Uh, thanks to Barbara and also to Brian who was doing tech in the background. So blessings to you all. Take care, everybody. I'm going to leave your platform. Have a good evening. I hope everybody had a nice Thanksgiving yesterday, and I hope you have a lovely rest of the week. Take care now. Bye-bye.